About a week ago, I got an email from Zach saying they were going to be in town. Where are you guys? Raise your hands. I hope, oh, here's Zach. The whole Kelly family's here. Uh, Zach's one of our own. Uh, but Doyle and Janet and Kara and their families are here this morning. Be sure and get a chance to, to hug their necks. But Zach's one of our kids. Uh, he went on one of the first mission trips we took down into Mexico and went on several after that. You know, I've taken a lot of kids down into Mexico and into Honduras over the years. Every kid is affected, but these kids affected a little differently. Well, Zach got the mission bug uh, under his skin. He's been, on, uh, been to Africa for mission works. He's been to Chile. Lots of other places I don't have written down with me this morning, but uh, got a bug for missions. Uh, graduated from Harding a couple of years ago, married his wife, Elise, uh, and they are currently working in Avanti, Italy. I'll let you tell, him a little, tell you a little bit more about that work, but uh, we're real proud of Zach. We're proud of the work he's doing over there. He takes his work very seriously, and he's doing a fantastic job, and he's turning that work around. So, Zach, uh, he's here to give a, a presentation, a little bit about his work, but he's going to preach a sermon for us again this morning. So, we appreciate you being here, brother. Thank you. All right, so I'll go ahead and tell you that I, I don't preach on a normal basis. So, if you don't like the sermon, that's okay. I, I don't preach normally. And I do get really nervous being in front of a lot of people because our, our, the congregation we know, that we normally work with is a, about 10 people. So you are a little bit bigger than what I normally am used to working with. So uh, my name is Zach and my family's back there, just like Glenn uh, pointed out. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's really amazing to be here, to be in front of everyone. Um, what's really amazing is I don't know some of you. And so that's, it's so encouraging to see new faces, to see our community growing. Uh, and be and still becoming effective, still being lights to Fort Gibson and and uh, the surrounding areas. So yeah, I, I live and work in Scandici, Italy, and it is a, a tiny suburb of about 60,000 people. So tiny suburb outside of Florence, Italy. Um, I'm, I'm about a 10-minute bus ride away from the center of Florence, and uh, we we ended up there through a really strange series of events. Um, we, we said no, we would not do this multiple times before the Lord kept opening the door and said, no, you're going to do this. So even though it sounds like, yeah, anyone who had an opportunity to work in Italy might just jump at that, we did not. We, we said no and kept trying not to do it. And that's, uh, that's how we ended up there. That's how God works in my life a lot of times. Uh, and so we work with a program that actually brings recent college graduates over to teach English using the Bible for two-year commitments, and we direct the program, and we actually all live in one building. It's a, an apartment building that was, uh, so it has been renovated many, too many times into the, the building it is now uh, that functions as a place for our teachers to live, but also for our, our students uh, to come. And so uh, what do our students look like? Well, our students range from, um, I have students who are nine, uh, and then I have students who are 79. So my, my students range all over, and, and those who come to our, our school to learn English using the Bible come from many different, back, different backgrounds and even different countries. Uh, we do work with, with several other immigrants, and let me tell you, it is a humbling experience to be an immigrant, uh, to be someone who's going through bureaucracy. And uh, the, one, of the biggest, one of the first questions I get is, how is my Italian? And uh, my answer is, I spend a lot of time in government offices, so my Italian better be good. So it just learn by fire, being thrown into, into it and, uh, and having that opportunity to learn it. So our, our students really come on foot. Most of them actually walk to our school because in, in, in Italy, most people walk places or you take public transportation. But a lot of our students just come from right around where we are. And we, we never have to do any, any advertising. The, the school has been there long enough that it has such a reputation in our community that people just show up. And there's a big sign over the door that, that says the Bible school, and that always interests people. And sometimes they come, and, and sometimes they really don't have any interest in studying the Bible. And we just tell them, well, that's what we use to teach English, so tough. But yeah, so normally, normally though, most, most people have no problem with that because Italy is a heavily, a heavily dominated culture in church and in the, in the Catholic Catholic. Uh, religion, but it's really just a, a Catholic country, and so when we when we do approach uh, teaching the Bible and, and experiencing the Bible, we have run into a lot of 
a lot of different mindsets that I didn't grow up with. I've had to, to go back and, and relearn how, how, do, how does a Catholic look at the Bible and how does a Catholic experience, uh, experience Jesus for me to have a meaningful conversation with that person. I need to understand where they are and where they come from and to respect that and, and not, not to try and trample on that but to work with it. I need to get my notes out or I'm just going to ramble into eternity and that would not be wonderful. Okay. Don't worry, it's just a couple pages. Some of you got a little nervous there. Uh, and so we have these uh, workers come in from, from the states. And so a lot of what we do is actually working with Americans who come in. We, we help mentor them. We help prepare them for teaching in Italy. Most of our, most of our teachers don't come out of college with teaching degrees. Most of, most of them don't come knowing how to make a lesson plan. And some of them come not even really remembering all the Schoolhouse Rock videos and remembering how parts of speech work. And so we do spend a lot of time just trying to prepare our, prepare our workers and see those little schoolhouse rock jingles to make sure that we all remember um, fun tools and teaching English but a lot of what we do is just helping our workers figure out how do we take the Word of God and transform that into a lesson that not only teaches someone some English but it invites them into a relationship with with God and so one one way that this works you know, I, I did a, I did a, a youth internship in California for one summer and I walked away from that summer going I'm so glad there are people who do youth ministry and that's just not for me. Uh, but I actually spent a lot of time working with teenagers in Italy as a, a fun twist. Well, one of, my, one of my teenage boys is very good at English, but if I, if I say to you words like, let's hang out, let's dress up, you need to get over it, let's work through it, those are called phrasal verbs. And most, when you're learning a language, those are really hard things to work because if you say hang out, someone thinks of something hanging from a hook and something that's outside. And so when you say let's go hang out, they're like, I don't know what that means, but that doesn't sound fun. So let's not do that. Uh, and so, we, so I, 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 what I did was I, I go to uh, one of my favorite stories, the story of Joseph, and we talk about, you know, Joseph went down into Egypt and Joseph, he, he was put in the well, so we talk about the directions of going in the well, coming out of the well, going down into Egypt, going through the desert, and so fun things like that, where we actually do learn parts of speech, we do learn some English, but at the end of the day, that person walks away thinking about the story of Joseph and how it relates to their English learning, English learning experience. Um, now, that's one example of what I do. Another example of what I do is I have a student who first day of class walked in and said, you know, I just don't believe in God. But I'm, I'm okay talking about God, and I said, "Oh, I can, I can do that. We, we can work with this. Let's go." And uh, over time, we have moved from he doesn't believe in God to he is open to an experience with God, and I consider that a really huge step for him. And so we are slowly working through things. But the the most encouraging part of, the, of that story for me was was him. Uh, he broke his foot, and he said, "I, I broke my foot. I can't come to you, but I still want to learn." So if you can come to me, come to my apartment, and I said, yes, I'll be right there. So uh, we just see these, these little little signs of affirmation as being just really positive uh, reinforcements of, of our work there. Uh, and then really weird things happen. It's just, uh, we, I, I have a student whose name is Michel Michelangelo, which yes, is like the, a really big Italian name and, and a very famous Florentine. But uh, and I work with, with him and my wife works with his wife and so what we did was we kind of got in cahoots and we, I was teaching him the same lessons that my wife was teaching his wife and so they would go home and talk about it together not knowing that the other one had studied the same thing. And what we did was we, we created this experience for this, this couple to go home and, and talk about what they're learning, talk about the things that they're experiencing and that's just a lot of fun. Uh, and so we are weirdos in Italy. We both are in our 20s and have college degrees and a child, which is not how Italy works. How Italy works is people wait until their late 30s to get married and then they have kids right away uh, because they just they wait so long. And so we are this weird anomaly and people are always kind of like, what's going on with you guys? And yes, we're weird, but it, it does create curiosity. And I can work with curiosity. If you want to know about my life, well, great, I'm here, to, I'm here to be a part of your life, so let's talk about that. 
Um, and so a lot of a lot of there are a lot of linguistic missions out there. People who go to other countries to teach English using the Bible. And so what makes us different? What what makes it worth coming to do two years of, of life and also I mean, for us to, to spend longer than that? What we really encourage our workers to do is not not to see your English lesson as the vehicle of your ministry but to see it as the door to your ministry. Because if someone came to you and said, I, I want to study astrophysics with, with you for one hour every week, are, are you going to learn astrophysics? And how long is that going to take you? A really long time. And so what, what we do is, yes, that, that, that hour a week is time for us to be in your life. It's time for us to be there with people and being in the Word, most importantly. But it's, it's an opportunity for us to say, hey, our hour is over. I'm free tomorrow at 2. Do you want to get coffee? And the answer is always yes. Italians are super relational. And if you invite someone to coffee there, just they say, yes, we'll be there. Or to lunch or dinner or whatever it is. And so we, we see our class time as an opportunity to be in someone's life, to be living daily life with them, whatever that looks like. Uh, and so one, one, one way that that has looked is the couple that Elise and I work with, they are, they're having a baby, but they don't know any other young people with children. But because we are in their life, this is now another opportunity for us to continue living life alongside of them and just being, being a mentor to them and, and just loving them in that way. So what I want to do this morning for a sermon is to invite you into a, a common one-on-one -on -one discussion that I would have with my students on, on any given day. You know, a really prevalent view of God in the, in the Catholic culture is that the Old Testament God is angry and wrathful and just loves to punish people and that when God sends Jesus is because he changed his mind. So, New Testament God changes his mind and has grace and mercy through Jesus. And what I try to do is take a step back and say, if God changes, I'm out. That's one of my core tenets is God doesn't change. And so how can we foster this, this mindset of, no, God doesn't change. What God says is good and true is always good and true. And in fact, it's when man decides what's good and true for themselves that things really fall apart. I do a lot of this. I'm, I'm sorry. It's my workout for the day. So the, the purpose of our program is to teach English using the Bible, but Elise and I have both been blessed with, with uh, some students who already speak English and who are really just interested in learning the Bible, which is a, a tremendous opportunity. So in these situations, we do our best to engage our students into meaningful conversations about the Bible while attempting to, to invite them into a relationship to help them become disciples of Christ. So where would you start? If you wanted to teach someone about Jesus, I ask a lot of questions. I'm a teacher. I ask questions people answer. But you don't have to answer. So when, normally when I ask this question, people say, well, if I want to teach someone about Jesus, I would start in the Gospels. And, and don't get me wrong, the Gospels are a great place to start. But I really think that Genesis sets the stage for Jesus on a much grander scale than the Gospels do. So we start in the, in the very beginning. This is important uh, to, to change that mindset about an angry and wrathful God. And instead to, to reimagine the stories of the, of the Old Testament with a, with a lens of looking at God as God who is desperate for a relationship with His people. Who is desperate to be a part of your life. So we start at the very beginning. We devote our, our first semester, we have spring semester and a fall semester. And uh, with those who are interested in studying the Bible, we, we just go year round. But we, we devote our first semester and sometimes even our first year into studying just the stories of Genesis in order to help reintroduce people to, to this new version of God, that this, new, this new idea that God is not just here to punish people, but that He is here to, here to love people. My students usually start to ask, well, when is Jesus coming into the story? When they start to see the, the Christmas decorations go up and they remember the story about baby Jesus and, and lucky for them, uh, nothing really helps set the stage for the birth of Jesus quite like the book of Exodus, am I right? So, yeah, so the, the first two chapters of, of Exodus are, are really cool chapters. And there are really, there's some really cool ways to compare and contrast the, story, the birth stories of Moses and the birth story of Jesus. And while I'm not going to preach that today, I hope that that may have inspired you to go and check some of those out on your own. Now, the, the lives of, of Moses and Jesus are really different, but they do have some striking similarities. Uh, and the, these similarities continue to unfold in Jesus and his ministry with the story of Israel. And so it's fun to, to do that compare and contrast, to give people a better, a better picture of the Bible as a whole story, as a narrative, 
and not as this is Old Testament written a really long time ago, and this is New Testament written a long time ago, but not that long ago. Especially in Italy, when every, everything is super old, how you're, the way that you talk about something being old is just very different than the way you talk about something being old here. We will live in homes older than our country, and that's just a humbling, a humbling thing sometimes. But so uh, today, I want, I want to focus on the, the story of Jesus in the desert interacting with the devil. So you're safe. We're going to focus in the New Testament for a little while in, in Matthew chapter four. Uh, and I, what, what I want to focus on is the interaction between these spiritual forces, the spiritual force of, of good and, and evil. And this, this story is strategically placed for Jesus to go from his private carpenter career to, to a public preaching career where he is the Son of God. This, this career that, that, that we are bookended with these epic battles of spiritual warfare. Yes, I do love Tolkien and love all these uh, C.S. Lewis, so I like to use words like epic battle and good and evil, and uh, it just helps me to, to imagine these stories. But the story is really fun with, with Italians because they recognize it from famous art. They don't really recognize it from going to church and hearing the story, but a lot of them uh, will, will recognize stories from if you just kind of pull a picture on Google and say, remember this picture from the Renaissance, and they can tell you all about the picture and the artist, but not really the story. And so it, Italians tend to have these really scary images of, of the personification of evil, of the devil, through Renaissance art. And so we have the, the, the image of, of the devil just in this picture alone it can go from a dragon to like a monk that has dragon feet or a snake that has uh, a woman's head. Very interesting, very, very odd and bizarre sometimes. But uh, they tend to have some pretty amazing images of, of evil when we talk about this story. And it's fun to, uh, to unpack it for them. So but what I want to focus on is, is not, not what evil looks like here, but I, I don't want to give too much credit ever to, to who the devil is and how he interacts in our lives. What I want to focus on is how good interacts with evil in the story. So in, in Matthew 4, we're going to go ahead and read that. So if you do want to open up there, uh, just right at the beginning of Matthew 4. So the, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, as you would imagine. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall, not worship, or you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. Great story. Anytime we teach a lesson with a student, what we, what we always focus on is this is a wonderful story that was never meant to be read alone. It was never meant to be just pulled out and, and focused on. It is, a, it is a, a, a picture. You're looking at a very small piece of a very big picture. So what we want to do is, is bring them back a little bit and walk through them. What is going on here? We just open up the story with him being led into the desert by the Spirit to be tested. Well, I want to bring you back a little bit to chapter 3 where John the Baptist, this crazy guy in camel hair, and eats, uh, eats all organic food, which is really trendy now, so he would be very trendy today. Uh, back then he was not very trendy. And he is preparing the way for who Jesus is, and, and Jesus goes uh, into, the, into the water. He's, he's baptized in this really public announcement of who Jesus is comes over God's intercom and says, this is my son. This is the son of God. This is like the, the public announcement of the son of God with whom I am well pleased. Let me get back to the notes because, man, you just don't want me to ramble on and on. 
So the context of the story is that it is never meant to be alone. Uh, this is a preparation for who Jesus is going to be. And then he's, he's led into the desert to be tested. What I want to focus on though is what, what does God say? God tells Jesus who he is. God, and what we know from, from the very beginning, from the very first story, that what God says is good. What God says is always good. Okay. So, the Spirit publicly announces that, that, that He's the Son of God, and then the Spirit leads Him into the desert. He isn't lured there by the devil. Jesus is led there to be tested. That is the purpose of, of this journey in the desert, is to be tested. So, a, a scholar that I follow recommends uh, translating this word uh, that we use for tempt as test instead. And the example he gives is when a teacher teaches something new, what do they do to make sure that you are confident in that, in that material? It is they give a, a test. And some of you may say that they, uh, the teachers tempt you, but let's stay with the test on that one. So the, the, the purpose of a test is to reveal the, the confidence in what they've learned and, and if, they, if they believe that that teacher is good, if they believe what that teacher is saying is good and true. So the story is not about Jesus being lured into a trap, but it's a story about Jesus being led into the desert by the Spirit. He's intentionally led into a, led into a situation where his confidence in what God says is good and true is good and true. And he's going to be given opportunities to decide what's good and true for himself. At this point, I would stop the story with my students and ask them, does this story sound familiar? Does this storyline sound familiar where, where, where the, the tester comes in and wants to poke holes in what you think is good and true about God? We'll come back to that. So, right, right, right now, this story is really 2D. It's really just kind of words on a page. So what, what I want to do is lift it off the page and make it a little 3D. No, I don't, I don't have any fun uh, props or anything, but let's, let's try and imagine this story in, in a new way. So, so Jesus is the Son of God who, as a, as a child, went into Egypt, came out of Egypt, and before he launches into his public career as the, the Son of God, uh, he, he goes into the river and he comes out of the water uh, and then is led into the wilderness to be tested. Who, who else follows this storyline? Because there, there is definitely, this storyline is not new. Nothing in the Bible is new, especially when you get to the New Testament stories. Everything is, is amazingly connected and tied to the, to the Old Testament. Well, Israel, Israel, they go into Egypt, they come out of Egypt. They go through some water, and they're led into the wilderness to be tested, just like Jesus is. And so this is where I do my compare and contrast. We, we go back to the Old Testament, we come to the New Testament, and we just create this, this broad picture of how it all connects. And not to be, it's not this disconnected thing. So, so Jesus, well, the Israelites spend 40 years in the desert instead of 40 days, but all the literary elements here are the same. The story uh, takes Israel from, from forgotten slave people and publicly announces them to the ancient world as the chosen people of a God who is more powerful than Pharaoh. This is really cool. So Matthew's gospel narrative follows the story of Israel to help connect readers to Jesus, or, uh, to connect Jesus back to the beginning of the story where God pursues relationship with His people. If you want to test this theory seriously, go through Matthew. See how it connects to the Old Testament. It's a really fun thing to do. Maybe I just think that's fun because I'm a nerd. Anyway, so the, the whole commandment. Uh, let's. So Jesus was was tested in the wilderness to remind us of Israel being led into the wilderness. So we're going to flip over to Deuteronomy 8 because I am an Old Testament dweller. I spend a lot of my time here and could not possibly preach a sermon without reading some good Torah. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and if you don't see the connections with what's happening so far, this is really going to shed some light on that. The whole commandment, this is in, starting in verse 1, The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give you. Uh, to give your fathers, and you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these forty years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you, 
and let you hunger, and be fed, and, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know, that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. I feel like I've read this today. Uh, in verse 4, your clothing did not wear out, and, and your foot did not swell these forty years. Know then in your heart, as man disciplines his son, the Lord, the Lord God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of your Lord, your God, by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Let me switch over here. Yeah, so if, you, if you're reading that story in Matthew and you're like, this is good, old, this sounds like Old Testament. It is, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 8. So, how does Israel do on their test? They fail. I mean, they want to go back to Egypt. Like, that's how bad they fail. They want to go back to the place where they were slaves. That's how poorly they, they do on this. But what I want you to, to, no, to notice from Deuteronomy chapter 8 is that the way that God interacts with Israel. So, God, he, he gives them, this is what's good. I'm giving you everything that's good. But not only that, he invites them into a partnership. He wants God, all, all, Almighty Yahweh, is inviting them into a partnership to help be agents of that goodness, to help spread the goodness of the, the gospel of, of God. So God, God reveals what is good and true. He invites them into a partnership. Uh, his, and His people are tested and they fail by choosing to decide what's good for themselves instead of allowing God to decide what's good and true for them. So they, they definitely fail this test. Jesus goes through the same style of testing where he he succeeds in their place where, where his people fail, he has now succeeded. He has gone and gone through the same testing that they have and has come out of it. He he has conquered it. So is is there now we we've saved all of Israel. So so Jesus has he has succeeded where Israel failed, but if, if we stop there, then we really do a major injustice to the story again, because Jesus did not come just to save Israel, but, but he's come to save the entire thing. And so can we think of another story where man is given a specific role, with, where, they, where God tells them what is good, God invites them into a partnership in that goodness, and then the tester comes along and tries to tell them what is good and true, or it try, tries to invite them into deciding what is good and true for themselves. Adam and Eve. All stories in the Bible lead back to Adam and Eve. This is another one that I really invite you to, 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 to explore on your own. And again, maybe I'm just the super nerd who does this, but I think it's a lot of fun and really helpful to understanding the Bible. But all stories lead to Adam and Eve. So uh, Matthew, he, want, he, wants us to, he wants us to connect his readers back to Israel, but also connect them to the garden. To connect them back to this, this time when the tester appears to man and tries to manipulate the words of God. And push them in a direction where they decide what's good and true. So how does the tester try to create doubt in Jesus? How, what are the seeds of doubt that are sown to try and get Jesus to, to decide what's good for himself instead of letting God decide what's good? Well, he does exactly the same tactic. He, he goes right at God's words and, and he says, If you are the Son of God, well, Matthew chapter 3, that's what God says. That, that's his whole announcement is, This is my Son. This is the Son of God. And so, immediately Satan wants to question that. If you are the Son of God, then... then the very hungry son of God, tell these these uh, these these stones to become bread and, and eat them. And Jesus' response, I think, is just so amazing here. I mean, his his life is on the line. He hasn't eaten in forty days, and he says, "People don't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God." And so, what is he saying in this situation? Is is that his life is not sustained by food? He he he, he changes the word. His 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 life. Is not sustained by food, but it, but it's, it's sustained by what comes from God. It, it is sustained by what God says is good and true. So, test number two: yeah, the, the devil takes him to the tallest temple. So, if, if you will, God takes the he, uh, Satan takes the representative of God to the place that represents God and wants to just test it all. So he says, "Throw yourself off of that thing." Uh, and uh, and again. Christ comes back, and, and, but Satan says the same thing. If you are the Son of God, if this is true about you, then just let, let's test that. And Jesus comes back again, 
And he, he quotes another scripture. He passes the test. And he points out that Jesus is not, is not there to make God represent him. He is there to represent God. Man doesn't get to decide how God rep represents them. We are here to be representatives of the true, the true creator. So test number three, I am going to wrap it up, so don't, don't worry too much. I, I am looking at, looking at the times and just make sure I don't go way over. But. So the tester takes him up to, to the highest mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and what they have to offer. And if Jesus will just bow down, then he changes the tactic. If Jesus will just bow down and worship the tester, then, then he can have it all. So what, what is the real test here? Well, the, the test is, he's testing Jesus' destiny. He's testing his future. But if you are going to be this king, savior of the world, here's one way to do it. Here's, here's the, the Satan's way to do it. And, and uh, Jesus passes this by, by first commanding evil to leave. So there's something to be said about that. Commanding evil to leave. He says, you, it is written, you, you shall not worship any other God. God comes first. Because in, in the kingdom of Jesus, it, it is not one where people, where, where the nations will, will gather, where conquered nations are gathered to, to serve a king. In Jesus' nation, it's upside down. And in his, in his kingdom is upside down. He comes to serve. So if you think of a triangle, he's, Jesus is not at the top making all those below him serve him and, and point towards him. He's at the bottom of this triangle, pointing up, sending those out to serve others. I told you, it's kind of like CrossFit. So, the same... Uh, Jesus has won over evil, but the, the presence of evil is not gone from Christ's life. It's not, it's not gone from his ministry experience. He will encounter evil in so many other ways. But before, before his death, but he will always maintain confidence in that what God says is good and true is good and true. He never, never wavers on that. He never, never questions this. The same person who, who encountered this evil, who overcame its test, who commanded it to leave, is also inviting you into that relationship, into the covenant partnership, into spreading the goodness of God. Into the, the, the same partnership that God invited Adam to, and Noah, and Abraham, it is this invitation to partner with God in spreading God's goodness to the nations. That, that invitation goes, goes beyond these people who lived a really long time ago. It goes to you, and it, it comes to me. And it's our job to be those agents of goodness, to go out and, and to make disciples of Christ. And if you're interested in learning more about what that means, about what it means to be a disciple of Christ, then please uh, don't leave here today without finding somebody who can help you do that. Uh, and the bulls are handed out. There's a list of the elders and deacons and, and ministers. Just find somebody. Find somebody and, and talk to them. Start that conversation about what your life could look like if God decides for you what's good and true. And if we stop deciding for ourselves what's good and true. But uh, I'll end there and just invite you into that uh, if you're interested. Thanks so much. It is a blessing to be back here in, in, this, in this pulpit in front of people that, that have watched me grow up through some really crazy phases uh, and come out to, to a place I could have never imagined. Uh, thank you so much.